Hi, I'm Jason, the creator of The Gray Rooms. Well, episode 10 is about to land into your podcast feeds and get you one step closer to that finale. Time has flown this season. We want to spend a brief moment talking about our new and improved work of art, our website. Stop by and give it a look. It truly is something to see. And of course, don't miss out on anything Gray Rooms related by stopping by our YouTube channel and finding us on Spotify. Just search in the app or web browser and then subscribe to ensure that you will always be the first to get the newest episodes. Also, while you are there, feel free to drop us a five-star review and a rating. It really helps us continue to do what it is that we love, that and the support of our wonderful patrons. Patrons like Amy Nikolai, Ashley Enstrom, Brooks Bigley, Elizabeth Dowell, Jackalbot Snows, Jason Porras, Kathleen Clyde, Kelly Bear, Michael Velez, Michael Zenke, Michael Philick BG. Oh God, I, I think I butchered that one. Patrick Stewart, The Portrait of Knox Podcast, The Original Nick Show, and Ronald Watson. Thank you all for your support. We are truly humbled and enjoy your company. Without further ado, let's get on with the episode. You awake. The elevator is small and cramped. There is a strange old man. He's mumbling. You hear a ding, and he forces you out. You're lost. You have no memory of this place. How did you get here? Where are you? It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to the Grey Rooms. Season 2, Episode 10. Planting my sharp teeth into my own, his, my hands. The imposter shrieked and stumbled back, ripping himself away from my grasp. How dare he? How dare he do this? Don't hurt him! Please don't hurt him! Can't you see? I tried to scream. Can't you see that isn't me? Todd. Sitting on the ground. <laughs> but at least we're talking again, are we? <laughs> no more shut the fuck up, eh? <laughs> uh, I had a rough time down in the bar, all right. Uh, and then I became a dog. You became a dog? I don't want any pervy jokes, Todd. Yes, I became a dog. And then, just like every time, I died. Because that's all this place knows how to do! Killing and pain and cruelty. Ugh, fuck this place! Ugh! What? <clears throat> Why did you stop the elevator? Why are you sitting down? 
Well, miss, you were sitting down. He only seemed polite. Todd, since we've met, you farted on me and I've seen you cram your tongue into a plastic woman's mouth. Now, now, let's not go re-ashing the past. <clears throat> uh, miss, you remember what I said? I hated your kind of people out in the world, but here you... You're like a breath of fresh air of a drowning man. I'm still waiting for you to make this gross. Do, do, do you know why I'm here? Well, I think I'm here because I was an awful person. You don't seem much better. Exactly. We're here because we were right sheets the first time around. Except, well... What is it? I'm still a shit. You, you're... Something different. I like being the way I am. Makes things simple, but you're you're not simple. And I'll never be like you. It's like I used to tell the matriarch, you know, just because you want things to be so, don't make them that way. Sorry, matriarch? Yeah, my old clan matron. <laughs> I was a bitchy old spinster, <laughs> but she knew how to run a dome. Todd, you're not making sense. What domes? Uh, miss, did you get hit on the head a bit too hard as a doggy? Domes. You know, domes. You know, cities on Earth. Whoa, whoa, wait. You lived in clans? In cities under domes led by a matriarch? On Earth? Of course. How else were we supposed to live out under the ashfall, bleeding from our gums and eyes and buttholes, while a skittle trying to chew us to bits? Todd, I'm... I'm from Earth. But I don't have any idea what you're talking about. The Earth I'm from had beautiful blue skies and cities just stood out in the open. Well, bugger me blind, I knew it! I've been here a long time, miss. <laughs> a long time. I think I've met people like you before, from, from other places. Todd, you're staring at nothing. I'm not looking, miss. I'm listening. Miss, we came here because we were shits. You had that right. But I don't think I'm supposed to be here. It's like you said I'm from somewhere else. I think I got pulled here, like a trout on a hook. The warden, he told me. Why would that psychopath tell you anything? We get on, the warden and me. I think he, I think he thinks of me as his pet. I help him sometimes with his little projects. When they started up the rooms this time, Bob put me here on the elevator to keep him happy. To keep him... Calm. I don't think it worked. No, miss, I don't. I, I don't think he did. So, he told you. <clears throat> okay, so, if what you say is true, what am I supposed to do with it? Do, do with it like you please, miss. You, you're the special one, not old Todd. Todd's just... Todd. You just keep trying to understand, not willing to just give up. I thought I'd try and help a little as I can. Hey, thanks for... Thanks. You're kind of a monster, but I can tell you mean well. Of course, miss. I, for one, think I have a lot to offer to those with intelligence and charm. Ah, <coughs> <coughs> oh, just like so. <laughs> Jesus, Todd! Ugh. <coughs> <laughs> Every time I think that guy's trying to be a person, he... Ugh. Pulled here like a trout on a hook. What does that mean? Where the hell is Bob? He's not at the front desk. The bar's open. But Jake... 
maybe Jake's back? Oh, Bob, it's you. Yes, Miss Winters, it is me. You were hoping for someone else. I'm afraid Mr. Stone has been permanently retired. I know. I can still see the stains. Why are you in here, Bob? Given that Mr. Stone is no longer working this position, I thought I would spend some time in here contemplating... Humanity. You humans are obsessed with numbing your senses. All manner of substances to be drunk, injected or inhaled. You're given the most precious gift of all. Life itself. And what do you do? You run from it. Hide your precious little consciousness from any reality you do not wish to confront. It's disgusting. So, what are you? I'm sorry? You said, you humans. You've referred to me and Todd that way before. If you're not human, Bob, what are you? Uh, what I am, Miss Winters, is annoyed. Your encounters with the Warden notwithstanding, management has been very pleased with your time in the rooms. You're proving most effective. It's obnoxious. What the hell does that mean? Why am I here? And why the hell did the Warden kill Jake? Damn it, Bob! Now, now, Samantha. I have been nothing if not consistent in ignoring your pleas for understanding. That will not change. As for the Warden... It's as I said when you stood before my desk. Mr. Stone's spinal fluid soaking into your socks. The Warden is unpredictable. An ally of sorts to management. An old friend. And so he is allowed to do as he pleases. I'm afraid that's all I can tell you. <sighs> if you're going to be this unhelpful, the least you can do is make me a drink. For you, Miss Winters, I'd be happy to. What is this song? Why... Why is this so familiar? What? You listen to me. I think you better fucking listen to me, woman. I am the vessel of the Lord. You're a vessel of bullshit, John. I'm tired of being just another hooker in your hand. Samantha, I don't know where this is coming from, but you need to listen to me. I am your husband, and you will obey! I'm not your fucking wife! You married us in a bullshit ceremony with Davis and your boys as witnesses. And then you had me go spend the next night with the senator's son! Sam, listen to yourself. Why do you doubt me now? We are all a part of God's plan. We all have our role to play. He has seen fit to tell me what is best for the people of the world, and I have the honor of passing on his word. Well, I'm fucking sick of being your plaything. I'm done. God is good, Samantha. God is great. To hell with your God, and to hell with you, Jonathan Hicks. I hate that you make me do this, Samantha. Do you really do make me do this, Samantha?
You're my favorite player. If you just settle down and go now and miss with all the other people. That's right. Just listen to my voice and stop thinking for yourself. You're mine, and you'll always be mine. What the fuck? What? How? Is this... Oh, God, is this how you keep us in line? You're in my head. How are you doing this? This is unity, Samantha. You cannot resist God's will. God is good. God is great. Submit to his will. God is good. God is great. God is good. God is great. No! Never again! Never again! Oh, you bitch! Fuck your God! Done. You. I'll kill you. No, Davis, stop. Ah! Stop. 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 What? What is this? What is this? What is this? This is. This is the power that Hicks had. Power that Hicks had. And now. I have it. I have it. Davis, you are going to do exactly as I say. Listen to my voice. Because God is good. God is great. And I am your God. I killed him. I killed him. He was in my mind controlling me f for... for how long? Years? And not just me. So many people. He used that sick power and... At the end, I killed him. I had that power. I used it. Ah, Samantha. Done with your reverie. Is it true? Is what true? Are the things, these memories, these things I've seen, are they true? You tell me. You're the expert on the human condition. Do they feel true? I... Oh, God. Indeed. Though he has little to do with it. What... what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm sorry to say, all you can do is make a choice, Samantha. Ah, 
I can offer you a room, or you can wallow in your misery. I don't know how I could have ever mistaken you for human. One of the nicest things you ever said to me. Now then... I can offer you a room at a nice quiet research station. Or I can offer you a room with something sticky sweet. <sighs> I know I'm going to regret this, but I could go for something sweet. Very well. Room 833. I do so hope you enjoy your treat. Maybe we aren't that different after all, Todd. When I was young, I knew Aunt Alice was sick. Mother said so, and I could see the mania that crept behind her eyes in the pages of old photo albums. When Mother died, Alice was our only family. By default, I was sent to live with her. I was seven. She was much worse than I'd been told. I never knew her condition by name, and she never sought professional help. There was nothing to curb her wild delusions or compulsive lies. Aunt Alice referred to herself in the plural, the royal we. It's a habit I've always hated. We watched a movie today. We read the most interesting article about crystals. I imagine she kept a tiny friend inside of her pocketbook wherever she went. Unpredictable mood swings happen daily. She claimed a myriad of imagined illnesses and phobias. Narcissism, delusions of grandeur, and her covetous hypochondria made my childhood a living hell. I contracted Ebola for three days, she claimed. I never told her that was not how Ebola worked. August, she said one morning. My name was Aaron but she called me whatever she felt like calling me on any given day. I was crunching mouthfuls of cereal as she ripped the pages of the morning paper into small, nickel-sized shreds, lining them in a semicircle on the table around her in a delicate fan. With a dramatic air, she touched the gauze wrapped densely around her forearms. You'll have to excuse our bandages this morning. A Seagram's logged slur lurked in her words. We were shaving our legs and slipped. Just a mistake. I'm fearful of blood, you see. Somehow I lost consciousness and woke like this. I glanced up at her for a bit too long. That's right, you little shit. We had a mistake, an accident, like we had last time. That time, that was your fault. I'd learned long ago to avoid correcting her or speaking out of turn, so... I quietly stared into the rainbow-colored milk and shoveled a mouthful of breakfast down to avoid another punishment. You didn't correct Alice Hawthorne. For her previous mistake, I'd received a terrible beating. I accidentally walked in on her. That time she sat, naked, straddling the open toilet seat, digging the lines of mistakes into her skin with a small square blade. 
seven slices dotted haphazardly in a line along her ribs. They traced the grimace of a smile. It was still drooling blood even as she hit me with the plunger until the wooden handle splintered apart. How dare you walk in on us! You made us slip! She'd cut herself so many times below her naked breast, she said, all because I'd surprised her. You did this to us! Most of her allergies were also fabrications. She spent one week trying to convince me that she was allergic to the color blue. Another time it was beans. She said they'd make her die, but she ate hummus obsessively. I can still hear the snap of the carrots and the sloppy, nauseating open mouth chewing. I pointed out at the height of her fixation that she couldn't possibly be allergic to beans. She was easily consuming a dozen containers of a product made of them per week and little else. I was sent to my room for days. A padlock kept me there until I was starving and severely dehydrated. Good for nothing, she declared one afternoon as I watched an interior makeover show. How dare you insult us like this, after all we've done for you. This place isn't good enough. Where we lived was not good enough. It was dilapidated and cramped. Outside was a large two-story colonial cracking and crumbling with disrepair. Paths inside traced like ant farm mazes, room to room through piles of discarded soup tins, broken toys and moldering periodicals. Orange peels and the remains of shredded paperbacks lay everywhere. You are an ungrateful, greedy leech, she told me. Yet I asked for nothing, least of all the misery of her guardianship. One day, the things I watched proved too much disrespect, and in one swift motion, she swiped the television from its stand in a fury. It crashed face forward onto the heap below, where it remained for years to come. Added to the piles of errant stereo parts and empty Chinese takeouts that made up the floor. She ripped the cord from the wall and pulled the other end, like taffy, from the broken set and used it to beat me with indiscretion until the world went dark. And Alice's moods weren't always violent. At times she would be fun and spontaneous. More than once I came home to a tunnel built from couch cushions or blanket forts to new paths cut through our biohazardous abode to delightful surprises. A red velvet cake, my favorite. Another time a pile of books by an author I liked. Yet another time, a puppy. His life was short-lived. I don't know why she did it. I buried him in the yard. It's best not to describe how I found him, but in retrospect, I know this to be my breaking point. Reviling her. I felt powerless to continue to survive her. Every night, I dreamt of different ways to find myself free. Alice lying dead while fire burned this moldering pit down around her. Of the bullshit webs she'd weaved of her phobias and allergies, I knew only these to be true. Alice was a trypophobic. Small, symmetrical holes would trigger her into legitimate hysterics. Holes in innocuous, mundane things. Patterns in wire fencing. Coral. Once, she even broke down while passing a set of rattan patio furniture in the hardware store. One look at the rich, brown backing of tightly woven hexagons turned her to stone as she descended into a quiet shock. She was unable to move until a man came up to us. 
ma'am, are you all right? Snatching my hand, she snapped, Piss off! Our nephew and we are fine. Come, Abraham. Alice's only allergy that was not based in fantasy revealed itself when I was 13. She was hospitalized. That night, I remember looking to the sky and wishing she would die. I wished on those stars for this moment so many times, and here it was, within my grasp. But she was not a generous woman, and neither was fate. She'd been digging through the tool shed, searching through piles for some hubcaps that would complete some project she'd imagined in one of her manic states. Haphazardly, she'd thrown old bed springs and rusted cookware aside, and inadvertently crushed a small hive of three or four or seven thousand bees. I always knew, no matter what she told me, I wasn't lazy, lustful, prideful, or any of the other deadlies that she attempted to weaponize and diminish my resolve to endure. I asked for nothing, and Aunt Alice and the mouse in her pocket delivered it in abundance. I worked hard and earned every accolade and accomplishment of my youth on my own. I learned to escape her at school and buried myself in books long after being released for the day. I was second in my class when I graduated. At 17, I finally moved out and away from the abusive nest she hatefully created. According to her, I ruined her life transforming her into the angry magpie builder who curated the den of shiny garbage for the two of us to smother in over the last decade. After I left, I resolved to never speak to her again. I had no need or reason to. When I enrolled in college, I'd earned enough scholarships to pay my way. I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was simply following an interest that fascinated me for a number of years. You have to believe that I didn't realize what I was doing then. I know now. I was plotting my revenge. I was going to kill her. I'd chosen the university I did because they were one of the few colleges I'd applied to with an entomology program. I wanted to study insects, specifically the sociobiology and the behavior of honeybees. This degree is specialized and proceeded to be a lot of work to attain, but I graduated with honors and quickly found a job in the biology department of a large agricultural company. Our main product and income revolved around pollination. Specifically, we rented and transported thousands of beehives to work on farms throughout the continental United States. Our product, if you will, is greatly responsible for most of the country's agriculture. From almonds to avocados, the bees spend several months pollinating in California. After that, they're shipped to Washington for the apple blossoms. Then millions are sent to Maine for blueberry season. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, and with the decline in sustainability, our fees have skyrocketed. In a way, one thing keeps them from escaping in swarms across the roadway. Luck. You'll need your luck every day. The bees will only need their luck once. Hopefully, yours will keep you safe. One careless move by you or someone else on the road could spell disaster for the entire highway. Before you make an aggressive swerve around an 18-wheeler moving a bit too slow, ask yourself, could this be one of the ones stacked floor to ceiling with crates of live bees? They're everywhere, you know. Don't believe me? Google it. At any given time, 
Thousands of drivers could be one abrupt lane change away from being trapped in their cars while a jackknifed semi-truck's cargo of 100,000 angry insects swarm in clouds of punishment around them. They'll be looking for ways to defend themselves. For ways in. To bypass your air filters. Emerge in your car. To sting you through your vents. It happens. Not often. But it happens. You may have read or heard that bee populations across the world are dying off. Part of that is due to their transport from coast to coast. A great deal of the other news you've heard is sensationalism. They are dying, yes. But they're not endangered. Weather changes, pesticides, and disease kill them along with the estimated 25 to 30 percent of our hives that die yearly. Our company is making great headway in the field to change those statistics. I learned most of what I knew about bee breeding by observing the work done by Dr. Abeya. One day the world will know her name, and she'll be recognized for her brilliant research and dedication in the field. She is the solution to ending colony collapse disorder. I am fortunate enough to have her as my mentor. Our facility is state of the art. There's not another research lab quite like ours in the country. Occasionally, we lead groups through the expansive greenhouses to explain the expense of the research. Dr. Abeya's beauty, knowledge, and charisma is justification for the exorbitant cost of this facility by the end of one of her tours. The research we do is simple. Her tone was as rich as the scent of honey that hung in the air. Her accent, French and as exotic as the range of flowers that grow everywhere around us. Simple and not simple at the same time. The noon sky blazed high overhead, refracting down in rainbows through the angled prisms of glass above. The air hummed with the songs of bees as they ignored us, busying themselves about their work. A few of the shareholders glanced nervously around. I accompanied her on these tours to dissuade them from swatting. Bees are nice. Until you're not. Most of them. The air smelled sweet with orange blossoms and mint. Hybridization can occur naturally, but we simply do not have uh, time to allow nature to take the course. These insects, they are crucial to the food production. There may be a few of you who uh, recall the stories from the news about uh, the killer Africanized bees, no? She looked around, and many of them were nodding. This species will swarm and attack on Prerogt. They are problematic for the North American species, for they are other than the others. They are not natural, oui? Genetic mutations mixing with the other bees, they kill the healthy colonies. We are researching here so that we can beat Mother Nature as a game, oui? The antechamber door slid closed behind the group, and a fine mist begins to spray from overhead. One of the shareholders screwed his face curiously from behind the protective netting of his headgear. I moved closer to him and whispered, The ones we're about to show you are aggressive, but not to worry, the mist contains pheromones. It basically makes us invisible to them. He turned as pale as a sheet. I think I'll stay here, he said. Dr. Abeya chuckled. She lifted one of the many canisters that hung on the far wall and took a moment to get it working. Before long, wisps of smoke were expelling from within. She quietly opened the second set of doors to the chamber that housed one of our mutated hybrid colonies. We need to refrain from causing these bees from becoming alarmed, we? Oui? If there is anyone uncomfortable, please feel free to wait in the other chamber with the other man. No one made a move to turn back. Our success, she whispered. 
depends on curating the best traits into a new species, so we are breeding the violent genes out. Our hybrids are resilient, but they are also too aggressive. She pressed the nozzle of the canister against the lower side of the nearest crate and began to pump the bellows until the smoke forced into the hive spewed from the seams in thick clouds. She lifted the lid and removed one of the combs, revealing hundreds of enormous bees, lethargically fanning their wings. They are aggressive, but less so than other attempts. We are headed along the right path, Dr. Abeya whispered. See ya. The abdomen is the size of the average bumblebee, but these are different species, oui? Very large honeybees. They are faster, more efficient pollinators, and they make double the honey. A few of our new colonies look like this. This was the first we successfully engineered with the science we are doing here. She paused, admiring them ruefully as they twitched. Unfortunately, we simply do not have the space in this facility, so this colony is going to be destroyed, and we continue to move uh, closer towards our goal. Aaron will see to that, she said, winking at me. This way, gentlemen, as we continue our tour. When a colony is destroyed, there is paperwork. The paperwork is all lies. We couldn't do it. Dr. Abeya and I, it was wrong. So the bee boxes we burned were empty, and I relocated the full ones far away in the woods. We'd been doing it for months. What if Leonardo burned the Mona Lisa? The hybrids were our masterpiece. I loaded the crates into the company van instead of the incinerator, draped heavily in layers of linen, and left for the day. The perfect place to relocate this hive was just a few hours south. I did not find Alice at home when I arrived. This was convenient because I hoped not to. Though the top layer of garbage was new, the house was the same. I knew somewhere beneath the fossilized stratum of composting apple cores, my boyhood trauma remained. It called me back to orchestrate this. My magnum opus. Using smoke to subdue them, I went quickly to work. I placed the honeycombs throughout the piles of broken garbage in the shitty house, then went outside. The backyard was an unkempt forest of dandelions and uncut grass. I spent the rest of the afternoon digging. Hours passed before I heard her return. I don't know what she thought of the van parked in her driveway, if she'd thought anything of it at all. I watched through a window as she entered, wading through mountains of trash, her arms brimmed with more garbage for her rotten nest. She'd probably spent her day sifting through the bins of the neighborhood as I'd been outside in my bee suit digging her grave. When the bees swarmed her, she dropped most of her treasures and began swatting at them in the air. She held a broken china doll, clutched it by its arm. Swinging it to and fro, she smashed it into walls and furniture, sending clouds of porcelain shards and a fine dust of white into the air. The droning of the swarm grew louder as they darted undeterred around her swings. They landed on her by the thousands, 
ripping their barbed stingers away. Some died as others dug holes into her flesh. They stung her and buried themselves beneath her skin. Tiny living lumps crawling through her face by way of their holes, by way of her mouth and ears. They squirmed beneath her eyelids. She spat and clawed at her body and battered her eyes until they were hollow beneath and began to leak something viscous and milky. I still felt empty, hollow, wondering when the tide of satisfaction would rise within. It never came. Alice beat her face, blindly clutching at the piles of garbage for something hard enough to swat with. Finally grasping a plank of wood, she continued to beat her face until all that remained of her jaw was ruined lumps, battered beyond recognition. The anaphylaxis twisted her bloated tongue as her throat tightened. She grew puffy and red, then burgundy. Yet somehow she still managed to die screaming. I waited for the wails of agony to stop and re-entered. With cold sterility, I dragged her corpse outside. The skin was riddled with holes, a fascinatingly curious symmetry to them. Raw and bloodless, like the entrance wounds of a thousand tiny bullets, overfull and weeping through her clothing, with the satisfying blend of pus and venom of my long-awaited victory. She twitched and writhed, turning from red to purple in the growing twilight, as I pulled her foot first through the chest-high stalks of weeds overcrowding the path that led to my pit. She spasmed and squirmed, as though she were not quite done living, while I carelessly heaved her down, and I didn't care. The sound of my shovel slicing and the soft thud of its dirt were the only sounds that sang with the crickets in the darkness. It was well past midnight when I tamped the last load down. Exhaustion came over me then, and I decided I'd nap in the van before heading home. I awoke to the drone of bees. I thought it was a dream. The buzzing far off in the dark beyond the windshield. Something was moving in the moonlight through the open gate of the backyard. I observed a figure shambling and crouching amongst the overgrown weeds. It pulled a patch of dandelions from the ground and stuffed them up into its open mouth but the jaw was a disfigured pulp. And the flowers scattered to the ground. It tried again, and again, and then. It noticed me. A rhythmic, steady rumbling buzz building in crescendo and pitch swarmed the darkness as it approached. 
Desperately, I tried to bring the engine to life. Over and over I turned the ignition, but it sputtered in spite, eventually reduced to useless clicks as the battery died completely. Fear glued me to the spot as my sticky eyes gulped the sight of honeyed horror that was the stumbling corpse of Aunt Alice. She reached the van. She vibrated through the open passenger window as though beneath her skin a trapped electricity impulsed her to motion, sending her out from beneath the ground and beckoning her toward where I lay sleeping. Her skin rippled and thrummed with them. The ends of her fingers, like sharpened barbs, reached out to me, and as I began to scream, a thousand of my bees swarmed in unison from her body and into my mouth. And made a home. For at least a month now, we've begun each new day here in Aunt Alice's house. We follow the rising sun down the gravel drive, away from our collapsing French colonial hive, and into the neighboring yards. We ate Mrs. Harris's prized roses first. After that, headed south to feast on Mr. Graham's begonias. We swallowed them petal, pistol, and stamen. Whole. Next were the orange blossoms and clovers of homes we did not know. We ate them greedily, hungrily, and brought them back inside of me. Back inside to make the honey for the hive. We used our hands to pound and rip patterns in the drywall, wide cavities that we filled with our excrement a nectar so vile no one dare harvest and steal away, honey so putrid and sickly sweet that only we would want to eat. We stored it for the day that the flowers went away. It wouldn't take long before they were all gone. We ripped them up with greedy hands from ground and tree, from decorative pots from shrubbery, We brought the flowers home inside of me and oozed them out, shoveling them away and away and away, filling the holes for another day. At night we didn't sleep, resting wide awake, surviving on small rations from the shit-smeared holes in the wall we'd make. When we returned today, we... Oh no... I, I did it. It was a mistake, but I did it. I bumped the lamp that stood in the entry, the lamp that ended in a naked bulb and landed on a stack of Aunt Alice's copies of Good Housekeeping in Vogue. They didn't notice. Or maybe they didn't know what it meant when the stack began to smoke. For a month, they've crawled around inside, plucking at my brain and pulling synapses. Making me move. Making me eat their shit, honey. Making me do what they do. I felt myself regain control as the house began to fill with smoke. How fitting. I've dreamt of burning this place to the ground with her dead body inside for decades. Staring into the mirror, I could see Alice lying dead on the couch in the room beyond. A final proof that dark dreams really do come true. There was such rage and mania in my reflection as I began to understand. It ebbed and fell away, impotent and unimportant as I gazed at myself in the mirror. I thought I understood now. I realized this was okay. I could see them, a dozen or so, just past my pupils, deep inside. The rage waned, docile, like the bees asleep inside my brain. The rest of the hive were someplace deeper, 
could feel them moving beneath my skin, fanning their lethargic wings. In the mirror, the fire raged and the house began to fall to flames. The hot tongues of it lapped away the peeling wrappers of the broken walls, and my lungs began to ache. Around me, the room filled with smoke, but I never panicked. I hoped nobody would send for help. I hoped the fire would take everything. When they find us, they'll want to know. Maybe they'll see I made no move to leave, that I wanted to let the fire have us. My last hope that remained was it would run its course. I longed for it to lick the walls and peel the skin and boil my blood and consume my flesh, eat every piece of me whole, and then eat the bees, and then eat Alice, until all that remains of us is ash. Poetic justice sweetens the honey of revenge. I came here for her, and it's taken us both instead. The Honey of Revenge, written by Scott Savino, and performed by Mark Witten as Aaron, Aaron Lillis as Aunt Alice, Kelly Nianaltowski as Dr. Abeya, and Graham Rowett as the Hardware Man and the Shareholder. God is Good was written by Michael Zenke and performed by Sarah Thomas as Samantha Winters, David Cummings as Jonathan Hicks, Graham Rowett as Bob, Alistair Mackey as Todd, and Jason Wilson as Davis. Music composition was by J.M. Scherf. Artwork and web development, creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon support was by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. Audio and sound engineering was by me, Jason Wilson. Episode 10 is now in your feeds. And we are only two episodes away from the season rehash and then our final episode, the finale. We are moving forward with new ideas and creations to ensure you will have plenty to look forward to during this upcoming off-season. And speaking of things to entertain you, feel free to stop by our new and improved explosively awesome new website designed by Cassie Pertit at thegrayrooms.com. Seriously, it is so cool and awesome to see how this is growing. Thank you, Cassie and Ben. You guys killed it. We would also like to ask you to leave us a five-star rating and a review in Spotify or your podcast app of choice. It helps us to reach out to advertisers and sponsors to help grow the show and to continue to take care of our authors and talented voice actors. Thank you for your time and your ears. It is greatly appreciated. Stay tuned for more to come and feel free to stop by our Patreon page in the meantime to see if there's a tier there that interests you, as well as checking out some of our really awesome merch in our store. Links below. We bid you farewell as we climb back into our corners to continue to stitch together your next nightmare. Till then, good night, and we will see you in two weeks. <laughs>